Let's turn to Colossians chapter 3 tonight. I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 2. We're going to look at the last uh, few verses of this chapter together. Colossians chapter 2 tonight. And uh, as you're turning there, appreciate you being back in God's house tonight. Looking forward to what God's going to do in our midst, uh, not just tonight, but this week as we're faithful to Him. I uh, would ask for your partnership in prayer, so I don't forget to mention at the end of the service, we mentioned in our uh, church uh, prayer meeting tonight that we had before the service, but if you pray for Brother uh, Andrew Moore, his parents, and brother here tonight, but uh, he's been in the hospital since Friday, and some of you know that he has been, uh, he just hasn't felt well for a while. I don't know how long I would characterize it, but it's been several weeks, and they've been trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, he got tested for COVID and kind of the usual, you know, running through things, and he's been having some difficulty breathing. And so this week he's having some tests done, a uh, biopsy actually on a, a mass that they found uh, there uh, near his heart. And so he's having some drainage, I think, done tomorrow on his heart, the fluid there, biopsy of that, and then also um, uh, draining some fluid that's in his lungs as well. And they think all of that's maybe connected to that. So if you'd pray for them, I talked to Mandy and Andrew this afternoon, pray with them. And obviously they're working through that, pray for their family, what we can do to be an encouragement to them. She said that a lot of you ladies had already touched base with them even before today and its diagnosis, just what, what do you need? And so I encourage you to do that the next few days and week or so here, but we'll keep you posted on that if you pray for Brother Andrew and Miss Mandy and their family. And then just what's near and dear to my heart as well are others who have been um, battling illnesses that really we just have limited access to them right now. I'm thinking of some of our shut-ins that either are in nursing facilities or I'm thinking of Miss Dorothy Perry, one of our shut-ins. Uh, who's been in the hospital for about a month now. She had a stroke and it's just hard to even get her on the phone. She's doing pretty well considering, but just can't get to them. And so it's just a lot of folks, heartache. You know, we have the elections and racial tension and those kind of big things. And then there's just normal life going on and all of those struggles and some of this compounds that. And so I hope you pray for each of these um, that I mentioned and others that probably you're aware of as well for God's grace and strength. But I'm thank thankful that if we wait on the Lord, we'll not be disappointed. We just sang about that. He's worth waiting on. He's always going to deliver. And I uh, hope that you'll pray he'll do so in each of these situations. Let's stand together for able to do so tonight. We're going to begin in verse 16 of Colossians chapter 2 and read down through verse 23. Colossians chapter 2, and let's begin in verse uh, 23. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, Paul says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Let no man, verse 18, beguile you of your own re of your reward in a voluntary humility in worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. And not holding to the head, capital H there, from which all the body by joints and bands having nourish, uh, nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which, are, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will, worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. And so we're going to talk about tonight how Jesus completes us, specifically in the area of defending, complete in defense against false teaching, false doctrine. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us tonight. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we can come to you on the eve of this week and, and uh, the first day of this week and all that is to transpire. We thank you for sustaining us to this good day as we now enter into the month of November and we enter the full uh, throes of fall and as we anticipate the holidays and the transition in the new year, if you tarry your coming, we pray that you would help tonight to be a season of just feeding and strengthening of the body of Christ, that we would grow closer to you and to one another, that we would grow, um, that we would grow in understanding that you alone satisfy, you complete us, you fulfill us. And Lord, may we realize tonight that we already have tonight, November the 1st of 2020, we have access to everything we need and everything that we long for in the person and work of Christ. Help us to draw nigh to that. Help us to live in light of that practically, um, uh, more fully as a result of our time tonight. Um, and Lord, just help me to be faithful to teach your word, to preach it as you would have it taught and preached, and that each of us would hear it and apply it in our lives before you this week. Bless this study, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. 
Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I think we deal with in our day is a flippancy, flippancy toward things that are serious. Um, we treat those things sometimes lightly and specifically negative things or threats that are swirling around us. And I just want to say tonight as we begin, maybe to kind of dovetail with our study this morning, that we believe in the ultimate reign and the sovereignty of God. There, there are threats actively working around us uh, to undermine our faith, to assault the family, to, 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 to divide and conquer, to um, ruin the young hearts and minds in this building tonight and others like them. Um, and I think sometimes there's almost like a disconnect between, yes, Jesus is king, God is sovereign, but then our day-to-day, -day, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil like a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And so I think part of our satisfaction or our fullness is not just positive, the response to the, the positives that we have in Christ, but also the protective uh, aspects of Christ as it relates to the threats uh, or to the dangers that are around us. And so we need to practice uh, defensive satisfaction. Jesus is enough, I, enough. I don't need what you're offering. I don't need what you're peddling. I don't need what you are selling. The other day I saw this story, and I don't, I don't know if this story resonates with you. I, I've told you before, I'm not a fan of snakes, okay? So when I saw this story, um, it, it resonated with me in multiple ways. But this picture is taken in Israel of an eight-year-old little girl named Inbar, I-N-B-A-R. Um, and the pictures of her cooling off in her small background pool in Israel with one of her favorite swimming buddies, her pet python. Um, he is an 11-foot uh, yellow serpent named Bell, uh, one of the family's many pets, living happily together on this animal sanctuary that they have in southern Israel. Sarit Regev, uh, Regev uh, Inbar's mother, said the two have grown up together. Inbar was raised with all these animals. She was raised with snakes. When Inbar was little, she swam inside the bath with this specific snake. And now she's grown up and the snake has gotten bigger. They swim together in this pool. And she said this, kind of anticipating what maybe is your response when you see this picture or this story. She said, there are people that say, you're crazy. How can you do that? You don't love your kids you know, the threats possibly of this snake, to which she replied, it's a lovely life to live life like this. It's a lovely life. Now, I, you can do what you want. You want to swim at a big yellow snake, have at it. But there are certain threats that could possibly come to be realized uh, in that setting. And can I just say to you tonight, some of us, I think we're swimming with, or we're going downstream, if you will, with false teaching and it's undermining our satisfaction because here's the thought tonight. If I live believing false teaching or heresy in any sense, and yet I'm identifying with Jesus Christ, it may not be that there's an issue with Jesus and his teaching and doctrine. It's the other things I've let filter in that are hollowing out my fullness, hollowing out my satisfaction. So I'd like to tonight look at three specifically that Paul briefly covers here false teachings that kind of just creep in, that if we're not on the defensive, if we're not letting God uh, help us, we don't see them, let alone stand uh, against them. And so the question tonight is, in a world that insists on tolerance, how does the sufficiency of Christ provide for us the necessary protections against these threats or these false teachings uh, that swirl all around us? Let's talk about three defenses that are found only in Christ uh, in these areas of false teaching. Number one, first of all, Jesus is our defense, excuse me, against legalism. He is our defense against legalism. I'll try not to use too many illustrations from the book, but I'm reading right now a book about Great Britain, the Battle of Britain between the fall of France and America's entrance into the war. And they were talking about Winston Churchill, things that bothered him, the prime minister at the time of, of the UK. And he hated if someone else whistled, it just, it like just made his skin crawl. I mean, you think about all the other noises he was dealing with. You got bombs falling, like, you know, like just like raindrops on the city and all these other no dead bodies and crashing things and smoking things. But the thing that drove him most crazy was walking down the street in the midst of all this and someone would be whistling out loud. And what was interesting was, I never knew this, that actually was also a pet peeve of Adolf Hitler. And so Winston Churchill would often say, we at least have one thing in common. We hate people that whistle. And it's just funny to me how technical things, things bother us, things uh, get under our skin. And I think as it relates to legalism, sometimes the things that bother us, 
find us aligned with the devil himself. We're overemphasizing technical things that God's Word never clearly speaks to. And so Paul addresses that early in the text that we're studying tonight. Let's look at a couple of them, not on the slides, but they're in your notes tonight. There is that we can be satisfied with Christ in a defensive way or a protective way against uh, the false teaching of legalism. Number one, in verse 16, jot this down if you will, be satisfied with Christ's evaluation. The way to battle against or defend against legalism is to be satisfied with Christ's evaluation. How does Christ view you? How does Christ view me? The moment that our focus is upon what Jesus thinks of me and his view of me, that sucks all the power out of legalism. Because now I'm not being examined and scrutinized and evaluated by the opinions or standards of others. I'm being evaluated by Jesus' view of me. If you know Jesus Christ is your savior tonight, you've been declared righteous. You're free of earning or compensating for anything. Isn't that just, is that just good to hear tonight? Because we all have people trying to impose policies or standards on us. But if Jesus has declared us righteous, if he evaluates us to be complete in him... Uh, then we have no need to jump through the hoops of those things that are less than biblical. And he talks about two of them. I mentioned those to you briefly tonight. Look at verse 16. He talks about this legalism. First, he says, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. And so first of all, there in your notes, I think I gave you these sub points. First of all, in the area of diet. Uh, we have no need to let others tell us what we need to eat or not eat in order to be uh, considered spiritual or pleasing to God. We're free of that uh, in the sense of our relationship with the Lord. Um, and there are a lot of different teachings on diet. And some of you come from various church backgrounds. You could probably flesh these out in more detail. Um, there's a lot of different uh, backgrounds represented even in the room tonight. But for example, spiritism insists that their members abstain from eating meats. There are certain spiritist type of cults that would refrain from or mandate that their members or those that participate in the faith uh, would abstain from meats. For centuries, the Roman Catholics were not supposed to eat meat on Fridays. Remember that? I don't know that that's quite as prominent as it mo uh, once was. Uh, many churches require abstinence from certain types of food during Lent. Um, others, such as the Mormons, say a person cannot be a good member in good standing if they drink tea or coffee. And they're just those kind of technicalities that a lot of the religions of our day especially in days gone by, would emphasize and, and mandate was required to be in good standing with the church uh, or to be in good standing with God. Now, here's the truth tonight as it relates first to our diet, because that has come back up, has it not? Um, I don't want to open a can of worms tonight or a can of whatever is, is your preference tonight in the area of diet, but diet is greatly hindering the unity of the local church in our day. Um, and I think we need to be very careful not to overemphasize what maybe is even a good policy, a good health position, but is not aligned with the primary emphasis uh, that we see clearly in Scripture. And so here it is. The believer who's satisfied with Jesus makes it primarily about heart-level issues, not stomach-level issues. Um, Christ was very clear. It's not that which goeth into a man that defileth him, right? It's that which cometh out. Where does that come from? The heart. And so our religion, if we can use that term in the right sense, as James would do, uh, needs to emphasize the heart. And if we're satisfied with Jesus, then we make it about the heart issues, our own heart, as well as the hearts of those that we influence and lead. Uh, Romans 14, Paul chimes in earlier on this in chapter 14 and verse 17, for the kingdom of God, we've been talking about the kingdom of God today. The kingdom of God is not what? Meat and drink. Those are tangible, physical things, but righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. And so our satisfaction is derived not from physical diet, but from these spiritual disciplines uh, and fruit that are produced by uh, the Holy Spirit. And so it frees us from that. Um, and if you interact with others who are trying to impose that on you, don't let that hollow out your satisfaction in Christ. Uh, unplug from that and tap into this uh, which Christ gives to us. All right, then if you will notice the end of verse 16, he goes on to say not only meat and drink, the diet, or in respect of an holy day or of respect um, or of the new moon or of uh, the Sabbath days. Number two, put down in days. So there are two areas that, that we need to be satisfied with Christ when others criticize us. First, in diet. Number two, in our observance of days. Um, we talked about spiritism and Roman Catholics and Mormons and others, uh, their view of diet, um, 
probably the most notable as it relates to days where it still is in our day, a factor would be like the Seventh-day Adventist and their view of the Sabbath and, and, and their standards as it relates to that, that uh, we need to observe that in the strictest sense of the word. Um, probably the kind of less uh, uh, specific to a religion would be also the, the, the abstinence from certain negative days, Halloween. Wow, that could, we just had that, right? It was yesterday Halloween, I think. You can tell how big a deal it is for me. Um, but uh, Halloween was yesterday. Christmas, wow, you want to get some robust discussion going? Talk about the pagan roots of Christmas um, and observing Christmas. Um, those kind of emphasis and overemphasis upon days that we should observe and days that we shouldn't observe, um, let alone in this day, the Jewish view of certain holy days versus that of the Gentiles and all the dynamics that they were navigating in this church at Colossae. And Paul is emphasizing here, we are free of that. Our faith, our spiritual standing with Christ is not dependent upon that. Um, I believe every day is made by the Lord. This is a day the Lord has made. I'll rejoice and be glad in it. It's a day to live it as unto the Lord. And what legalism does, instead of living it as unto the Lord, I'm living it towards someone else. Are you good with what I'm doing today or what I'm eating today? And, and the emphasis is upon the evaluation of others. In Romans 14, or, excuse me, earlier before the verse that I just quoted, in verse 5, it says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day, regardeth it unto the Lord. He that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. It's key that we're doing it as unto the Lord. Um, and so be very careful not to let peer pressure, negative or positive, uh, in whatever sense you would view that, steer you away from being satisfied with uh, Jesus Christ. There are folks that if they eat, just eat, eat a certain product, there is a guilt associated with that, um, maybe because of how they were raised or if they, they would participate in something on a certain day or abstain from something on a certain day. Can I just encourage you, that's unhealthy. Is our satisfaction, is our, our standing with God built only on Jesus Christ? If it's anything else, plus or minus anything else, something's off there. And you're never going to be satisfied until it's derived from only who Jesus is and your faith and relationship with him. Not saying something shouldn't be eaten or some days shouldn't be carefully examined, but it's to be done as unto the Lord. Lose the legalism. And there's great liberty that comes, not only in the days and the diets, but just in our view of those who seek to control us and direct us. May we let Christ alone uh, be our Lord and Savior. Um, one author I was reading kind of summarized legalism as this, or kind of the, the negative implications of it. He said, legalism spawns ju judgmentalism. Judgmentalism is miserable for the judged and the judging. It shrivels the soul. Have you ever been in a setting where that's the case? Uh, secondly, he said, legalism is intrinsically joy joyless. There's no joy there. There's no happiness. There's no liberty there. Uh, thirdly, it demands uniformity. Wherever you find legalism dominant, you find people who dress the same way, use the same speech, posture, manners, even the same fa facial expressions. He said it's a grotesque kind of uniformity. There's no spirit leading. It's mechanical. And then lastly, I thought was most significant, he said legalism produces a surface faith. The thing I hate most about legalism is it does emphasize meat and drink instead of righteousness, peace, and joy. Those things we just talked about, which are the, the more substantive aspects of our faith. Um, the author said, because its adherents emphasize the things which are not really important, their do-nots ignore deadly sins like coveting, gossiping, slandering, bitterness, hatred. Legalism limits one to shallow self-righteousness and thus damns him, was his assessment. And so we need, to, we need to value the important things and not allow legalism to move us uh, away from those priorities. All right, then if you will, verse 17. And I love how Paul handles this and brings this now back to Christ. Verse 17, so he, he lists these things of which the legalist will grasp for and use as almost a weapon, weaponize it. He says, which are, remember Paul was a Pharisee, so this was something he had to come to terms with as well, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Number two, jot this down. Be satisfied with Christ's evaluation. That's how we counter the attacks of legalism. Number two, be satisfied with Christ's substance. The word there is substance. 
Paul says that all of the Old Testament law can be summarized as a shadow of things to come. It was a picture. It was a shadow. It was a foreshadowing of that which is reality, that which is substance. I would jot this down if you're taking notes tonight. The Old Testament was, it foreshadowed, Jesus fulfilled. So the Old Testament foreshadowed, whether it was dietary restrictions, um, sacrificial system, all of the things that were a part of the tabernacle and the temple and, and, and the things that preceded um, Christ, the incarnation, they were a foreshadowing. The Old Testament foreshadowed, Christ fulfilled. Um, I don't know about you, I, I, I guess I like shadows in some ways. You know, we talk doing shadow puppets or shadows, they, I guess, have a place and they're interesting. But if I have to pick between the shadow of a nice, cool, you know, shake or a nice warm coffee. Now I had somebody this morning ask me, will coffee be a part of heaven? And I'm like, I can't believe I've never sought and dug into that. I mean, I like coffee and I, I like heaven. Like, why don't I know the answer to that? But if it's between the shadow, a symbol, a drawing of that, or you actually, I want the real thing. Give me the substantive thing. Why would we, why would we choose to ha get hung up on or live in light of what are shadows when the real thing is shown up? Jesus, who is the Lamb of God. And we could go through all the different connections between these shadows and our Savior. Paul says, why would you be caught up in those things when the substance, the body of our faith, uh, is found in uh, Jesus Christ? Isn't it just like us as, as just human beings to get hung up on symbols? We forget what the symbol pictures. But we, we're caught up in, in the mysticism that we'll talk about in just a moment or other things. And we're all about just the symbolism instead of the substance of our faith. I'm definitely not picking on them when I mention this, but it, where we live right now on the county line of right into Ashland County, um, the, there are a lot of Amish right around us. And just a few weeks ago, we had, I don't even, I didn't see it in the news. We've had several buggy accidents lately in our area, some towards some other areas that you guys live in. But there was just off to the road on 250, just, just toward Worcester from our road, um, just, Amish, uh, just like in smithereens, like it was just like pulverized. And in my mind, probably that got hit by a, a semi or something pretty sizable. I didn't see anything about someone dying a fatality or something, but it was just off the road uh, there on 250. It could have been even one of maybe our neighbors just down the road from us. But isn't it interesting, the Amish and others of that, of that vein of thought, they get caught up in the, the symbol or the, 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 the standard versus... Um, what God is trying to show us through even those things. And we may, not ride in a, we may not have ridden in a buggy tonight to church, but we probably rode in with some predetermined kind of just religiosity and legalistic tendencies. We need to let Christ free us of that so that we might lean into who he is in a substantive way. Rules without relationship breed rebellion. Christ wants us to have relationship with him, not the rule, not the shadow with who he ultimately is. Could your lack of relationship with the incarnate Christ be because you're lost in the shadows instead of coming toward him to find satisfaction and relationship with him? I was reading a few months ago a story about a guy named Royal Robbins. I don't know if you remember him or not, but he was in days gone by a, a rock climber, professional rock climber. And he was regularly featured in like Sports Illustrated. He was a big thing back in the day. And he was talking about climbing, and he said, climbing is really an exercise in reality. He, he said this, as he's learned from his own uh, climbing days, he who sees it clearly is on safe ground, this reality, regardless of his experience or skill. But he who sees reality as he would like to see it, maybe, may have his illusions rudely stripped from his eyes when the ground comes up rather fastly reality like let's stop talking about symbolism and our preferences and how we were raised what is the reality in christ and may we derive our identity and our satisfaction from what has been declared of us through the finished work of christ it is only there that reality not legalism but in the reality of christ that we find satisfaction in the lord um a friend of mine said this recently. I don't know how, you know, where he got it or his thought, but he said heresy is just Pharisee without the P. You know, heresy is very close to legalism. In fact, it is heresy. Like we think, when you think of heresy, what do you think of? 
You probably think of, you know, the virgin birth isn't valid or Jesus wasn't the son of God or whatever. Legalism is heresy, dear beloved tonight. It's heresy. You're replacing the grace of God, the redemptive work of Jesus Christ upon the cross with what you do or don't do or what I do or don't do. It is bluntly put heresy. And so may we defend against it. No matter how it's presented, no matter who we know that believes or subscribes to it, may we be satisfied with Christ. All right, go back to our text, if you will, now to verse 18. And there's a second thing that being satisfied with Christ defends us from that we're tempted to move into as we see here in the believers in Colossae. Verse number 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Number two, secondly, we need to keep up or for the first time erect a defense against mysticism mysticism. Now, it's interesting to me that this follows in this sequence because often what happens, and I just want to caution those in the room who maybe have been in legalistic settings, the tendency is to make a pendulum swing in this direction. So, so I don't want to be a legalist, and so I don't want to be to this extreme, and what tends to happen that is we swing toward this kind of mystical, no real point of reference, no hard, firm, f- uh, fixed facts. It's just experiential. And so Paul here says, uh, in turn, don't only defend against or protect or look out for those who are legalists, but also defend or look out for those who are trying to draw you into mysticism. All right, a couple things as it relates to that where Christ can help us. Number one, be satisfied with Christ access, A-C-C-E-S-S. Be satisfied with Christ access. And you see here in verse 18 that they use this deceptive approach of we we will give you access to God. It's going to be through us. It's going to be through our mysticism that you can experience uh, relationship uh, with God. And it talks about, I think, first here at the beginning of verse 18 to meditation, um, that we would meditate upon certain things and or mediation, I'm sorry, that we would, we would look to them or something else to mediate or to be our in-between, our go-between us and God. We have Jesus Christ who gives us direct access to God. Why in the world do I need some other experience or facilitator of that experience to find God or to have new connection with God? I have access directly and consistently with God himself. I don't need a mediator. I don't need someone to go between me. And so these false teachers, whatever the specifics are, they often use basically, none of us have direct access, access to God. And so we have to go through these different phases of, uh, of, of getting to God. And part of it is worshiping angels. That's even a, a teaching that's prominent in our day. And none of us can go to God directly. And it's interesting, they claim to be a part of that access. Um, they use this, this mediation, these progressive phases of mediation to put themselves between us and God. I would remind you of 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5 where it says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Who is that? The man, Christ Jesus. We have him. We don't need someone else. We don't need to go to a mountaintop and levitate or put on a certain garb or whatever the specific thing that comes to your mind. We don't need a guru. We don't need someone to facilitate our relationship with God. We already have that uh, in Jesus Christ. I think even sometimes, just this maybe sidebar, even in worship, Um, I don't know that I mind the word necessarily, but I think the word experience is overused. Our worship in our church does not create a moment with God. It just elevates us to see God where he always is. Like there's a mysticism that I think is even creeping into a lot of so-called Christian worship or even teaching that's out there where we have to conjure up this moment with God. God is omnipresent. He's always here. We're just out of step with him. And what worship does is it reminds us of who God is and where he's always at. And it, it draws us into his presence. It's, it, it, it's simply a means to what already we have uh, in Jesus Christ. So be very careful with this mediation that we need something or someone uh, to help us click or connect uh, with a God who has already given us that access. All right. And then notice the end of verse 18. He goes on to say this this voluntary humility. Listen, we, we're just here to help you. Intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Number two, in vision. So in, in mediation, number two, in vision. Um, they claim to be able to see God. They claim to be able to know God. They are the access point um, to God. 
Uh, pray for my wife, if you will. She's out sick today, um, but my wife teaches, and um, one of the joys of teaching is you always have that one kid in every class, if you follow my drift. Some of you teach, you homeschool, and you have that same one kid in your, your class as well, or two. Um, and uh, there's a young man who was in our school. Uh, his name is Preston. And uh, uh, if you say Preston to my wife, I guarantee she will, she will have certain connotative feelings that come. He just gave her a run for her money. He would have been probably a, maybe a sophomore in high school when she first started teaching him English. And, you know, most sophomores through seniors, they're pumped to take English. I mean, just give me more grammar. Give me more. You know, yeah, right. And, uh, and it's been neat just to see uh, his growth. I ran into him just a few years ago. One of the joys of being a youth pastor or a teacher is to see them mature. And he has kids of his own now, and he's serving the Lord faithfully in Pennsylvania. But uh, his dad posted this the other day. This is a picture of, this gives you a picture of Preston, okay? And he's in a gift box. And do you see the tag at the bottom? Preston, from God to women. He's God's gift to women. That's his, I don't know what, if it was Halloween or some costume party. But I think this was just a few years ago. So it's still in him, this spirit that my wife bumped into every day. But do you know there are people who view themselves as that to others? They position themselves as God's gift to you, access to a word of knowledge, access to revelation, access to something. They're the means to that. And I think we have to be very careful to see through that facade to, to have a defense up toward those who seek to position themselves uh, in that place. And you notice that Paul's very clear. He says... They're intruding into things which they haven't seen. They're, they're falsely claiming to have seen God or seen something from God. And we must be careful to reject anything that we don't see uh, in Jesus Christ alone. And so this, this false humility was actually pride. They were using this to secure a prominent place for themselves in this hierarchy through which, quote unquote, we can see uh, the face of God. Um, just this kind of important summary of this, of this verse, and we'll move on these various religious practices that these men were performing, notice it was according to their own will. Um, you see them not, God did not lead them to do this. They were doing it of their own voluntary. Uh, they were beguiling of their own initiative. They were intruding into things they had not been invited into. They were driving it themselves. It wasn't from God. They had no scriptural authority. Um, I am very careful in our church. I hope this is always true. I pray this is true. When we speak as a church, we ought to speak with Scripture. Like, that's where our authority comes from. Um, and, and I think the answer to the mysticism is, okay, great thought, great, great vibe. But where is the Scripture for that? Where is the, the foundation for that? It, it evaporates, it eviscerates the mysticism that often creeps into our conversation and sadly sometimes into our church. Um, and so it all was vanity. It was all a sham, this learning of secrets of the spiritual world. It was enticing, and yet Paul called them to defend against it. Now, here's the thought um, that I find we're susceptible to this approach, is you'll see something new. There'll be a book. There'll be a podcast. There'll be someone on YouTube. There'll be something online. There'll be something, someone you meet who claims to have something new. Can I just share with you what I just found out or what I'm, I'm sensing is God's uh, maybe revelation or perceptive on, perception on a specific issue. And they begin to offer to you something new that others do not, do not know. The only way to protect ourselves from that at all costs is to be satisfied with Christ. Okay, great. You figured something out new. I've got everything I need in Jesus. I know that sounds super pious and spiritual, but we need to have that heart position toward all of uh, the things that swirl around us. Uh, C.S. Lewis once was giving a lecture uh, to King's College in 1944 in the University of London, uh, the King's College there in that university. And he said these words, the desire to be in the inner circle, whatever that may be, is one of the, quote, the great permanent mainsprings of human action. All of passions, the passion for the inner ring is most skillful in making a man who is not yet a very bad man to do very bad things. You're going to get in with this. You're, you're going to get on the inside. If you'll, if you'll open up your mind and heart to this new revelation, you're on the in. You're on the, the no in ways that others are not. May we reject that because we have access to God through Christ. 
I can go directly into God's presence. What else do you have to offer <laughs> that, can, that can supersede that? You know what I mean? That, that's the spirit in which we reject it. Who cares what the specifics are of everything I need in Christ? All right, verse 19. And not holding the head, all right, he's continuing to describe this mysticism, its flaws, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands have nourishment, ministereth and is knit together, increaseth with the, excuse me, the increase of God. Increaseth with the increase of God. Number two, be satisfied with Christ's headship. The word there is headship. Notice he says, these who are mystics, they're not holding to or they're not connected to the head. Capital H, who is that? That is Jesus. They are not connected to the head. That analogy has been used all throughout this book of Colossians. Um, I joked about this morning briefly, but Timothy Cotner uh, got his first deer last night. And the first wind I got of it was Matthew came. I was staying in the lobby talking to the foremans and Matthew came in and I was talking, but I could tell like he had, like he was about ready to burst. If he didn't tell me what was in his head and heart, he was just going to explode. And he was telling me, Timothy got it. He got one all on his own. He got it. I'm like, what did he get? He said, a deer. He got a deer all on his own. And, and I said, when or what? He said, today. I'm like, today? Like Sunday? Like he's had a full day. He already got a deer. And then I just saw him a minute ago. He's in church. I guess it was yesterday he got the deer. But there was just like, like Tim, to Matthew, Timothy is now a man. I mean, he took down a deer. I mean, he's arrived. He's basically the head of our family at this point. Okay, that was kind of the, the vibe that he gave. He was just wild by what his brother had done. And I saw a picture. It's a respectable deer, John, better than I think what you have so far this year. For the record, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It actually is, but, <laughs> uh, but the idea of headship, um, can I just say tonight, I think sometimes we, we let others creep in in leadership and influence in our lives because we've forgotten who the leader is, who the head is. Um, and these mystics, they're doing their own thing. They're off doing their own thing. They're disconnected from the headship of Christ. And the way for us to defend against that is to be satisfied with God is the head of my life. He is Lord. He is King. I'm submitted to him. And so the root of the problem is laid bare here in verse 14. This false teacher, this mystic, has lost his connection with the head. The false teachers obviously had no part in the body of Christ. They weren't even believers. And so obviously they're not connected to Christ. And the way that we, conversely or opposite, protect ourselves from their influence is to stay connected, to hold fast to the head. Who's the head of your life tonight? I found one of the best ways to push back against mysticism is to say, God, you call the shots today. You're in charge. You're the boss. I'm in the passenger seat at best. I'm in the back seat. I'm in the trunk. You drive. You direct. You're in charge. That keeps me from being prone to the appeals of mysticism. What is mysticism? You can have God on your terms. You can feel him and move and, 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 and move toward him on your terms and in your way. And that is in defiance of the headship of Jesus Christ. Now, may I just say this as well? The head, he says, not holding the head from which all the body. What is the body of Christ today? What is the body of Christ? It's the church. I see a de-emphasis upon the church and people who want to connect with God in mystic, decentralized ways. Um, you can't connect with God through YouTube or, you know, some, some gathering in another setting or some kind of just ethereal, mystical moment the way you will when you're in his church. When you're a part of his church. And so the way to counter this mysticism is to acknowledge the head and to be a part of the body. Um, I don't know how much longer our religious liberties will be at least as accessible as they are tonight. And we have believers in our day who take for granted the ability to gather as the body of Christ. The church matters. And what the mystics are convincing many believers of today, you can do it on your couch, you can do it on your terms, you can do it in your way. We're missing the body. We're missing the headship of Christ. And mysticism is having a field day. Let him be the head. Draw your satisfaction from him. I mean, what's, what's more inner circle than being a part of the body of Christ? What's more intimate with Christ than to be a part of his body? That's the inner circle. That's the innermost connection uh, we each can have uh, with the Lord Jesus. So let that be what defends your heart and life against mysticism. All right, lastly, look, if you will, now, verse 20 and following. There's a third thing that our satisfaction in Christ protects us from. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of this world, we talked about that term earlier in our text. It has the idea of elements. The rudiments are elements of the world. Why, as though living in the world, are you subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, 
handle a lot not. Thirdly and lastly, a defense against, and this is the big word for tonight, acid, uh, asceticism. Asceticism, defense against asceticism. And the word has this idea, it's a man-made system of rules where you're often abstaining from certain things, you're keeping from certain things. Asceticism is something that is prevalent uh, in our day. An example I was thinking of with this would be like uh, when I was in high school, it was the Just Say No campaign. That was a big deal my first few years of my high school years. Um, remember President Reagan, I think it was uh, Miss Nancy Reagan specifically, that was kind of the driving force behind that. And the war on drugs was in, was in uh, full-blown emphasis in the public spe- uh, uh, sector. And they were giving you various ways on how to say no to drugs. Just say no, just say no, just say no. And yet since then, from what I have observed and heard, it has, we've not gained a lot of ground on that front. It, it's running rampant, and there are new ways that's manifesting itself in our day. Can I just say tonight, spiritual discipline is good, but if your satisfaction in life is based upon how disciplined you are, that can, that can easily displace who Jesus longs to be in your life. Ultimately, your relationship with God is defined not by your discipline, but God's discipline, specifically God the Son's discipline. He, he gave himself. He sacrificed himself. He, he disciplined his mouth. He gave his body. He said, not my will, but thine be done. And so we do not earn favor with God uh, with this just say no. I'm just going to be disciplined. I'm going to bring my flesh under subjection and through it, I'm going to merit some sort of special standing with God. That will be the most dissatisfying, dissatisfying journey you'll ever go on. <laughs> Because discipline doesn't always go so well. We're in our flesh. We're parked in that. And we have to deal with that on a daily basis. And so we need to defend against uh, asceticism through uh, the work and will of God. All right, let's talk about two areas in this area. This teaching that we need to abstain. That's the way. If we can just bring our flesh, if we can control it, then we'll be satisfied. Number one, be satisfied with Christ's guiltlessness. Be satisfied with Christ's guiltlessness. I don't know if you've heard this term asceticism before or not, but the teaching is prevalent in our culture. And I think you'll start to think of areas you've seen this being pushed where you just kind of the simple life, the, the isolated life. You, 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 you withdraw from society. You give up the creature comforts that are so pervasive in our culture. But I believe a lot of that arises from guilt a sense of guilt, trying to compensate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to withhold from myself certain things so that I can feel better about where I am guilty uh, before the Lord. And yet Christ has taken away our guilt by his death, right? Go back to verse 13. We studied this last week. You being dead in your sins, on circumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting, the ordinances that were against us, which were contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So why in the world are we trying to discipline ourselves to make up for, to compensate for what has already been resolved in the finished work of Jesus Christ? We are guiltless if we know Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now, it's one thing to be disciplined because I want to pursue Christ. I want to progressively be sanctified. I'm talking about you're trying to discipline yourself to earn favor with God. Or if I, if I mess up in, certain, in a certain way, I doubt my very salvation. And this link between the two is, is, is antithetical to the teaching of God's word. Be satisfied with the guiltlessness that Christ has given to us. In verse number 20, you see, he talks about these basic elements of the world, these rituals and these ordinances. And Paul says, why are you, if you're dead with Christ to those things, why are you still living in light of them? Why are you giving them credence or acknowledging them in your day-to-day lives? You're free from those things. Um, I think Paul is referencing here Judaism. He's referring back to the, the, the prior faith of many of these believers and saying, you're free of that. Don't go back to that. You're dead to that. You're guiltless through what Christ has done. All right, verse 21. So he says, are you subject to ordinances? And then in verse 21, I think he's giving here examples of those ordinances. Touch not, certain things you shouldn't touch. Taste not, certain things you shouldn't taste. A reference likely back to verse 16. Handle not. Handle not. And I think it it probably helps us to understand verse 21 if we add such as to each of those. So don't, why are you following ordinances such as 
um, touch not, such as taste not, such as handle not? Why are you letting those things be what shapes your satisfaction or lack thereof? Uh, does this come to your mind when you hear especially touch not? You remember Eve in the garden? Um, if you go back to Genesis chapter 2, you see nowhere where God says they couldn't touch it. Did God, did God ever say to them, you can't touch it? And yet you see Eve adding to the word of God. Uh, we're, we're not even to touch it. God won't even let us touch it was kind of, I think, the vibe or the attitude in the text there. How did that end for Eve? Was she more satisfied because she added that extra little phrase to God's word? No, she actually caved and then she brought into her life all kinds of dissatisfaction. Her oldest son killed her next oldest son. And the heartache and the, break, the, the pushing out of the garden, the emptiness that followed. And we have been prone ever since to add to God's word and to add to it these kind of things. We can't touch something. We can't taste something. We can't handle something. We're never in God's word do we see that. So we need to be very careful with adding to this where we are guiltless before the Lord. With Christ, there's not a need to compensate for a false sense of guilt. Your practical personal sanctification... Uh, is not for standing with God, but from a position of already having standing with God. We live day to day pleasing to God. I start every day being right with God positionally. Don't you? If you know Christ as Savior. Then why are we so on, on eggshells about these specific little nuances of our faith? I'm not saying it's wrong to abstain from touching something or tasting something. Uh, but we need to make sure that our motive for doing so is not to compensate for uh, our relationship with God. May we draw satisfaction from the guiltlessness we have in Christ. I have standards in my life that I, I, I will never apologize for. I don't think I'll ever change. But none of those standards are where I find my satisfaction that I know God is my Savior, that I have peace with God, I have heaven someday. The fact that I don't go to certain restaurants or I don't drink certain things or I don't eat certain things or I don't watch certain things, how superficial it is to say that's where I find my standing with God. I'm going to always be unsettled then. Is it, was it enough? And did I compensate enough? And did I do enough and not do enough? It, it, we, we only make those decisions out of a place of peace with God, satisfaction with God, guiltlessness. I can now with clarity say no or yes to each of those respective things. All right, lastly, look at verse 22 and 23. Which all are to perish with the using, these things he just referenced. Why? After the commandments and doctrines of men. Verse 23, which things have a need of show of wisdom in, wi in will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. Lastly, jot this down. Be satisfied with Christ restraint. Be satisfied with Christ restraint. Some of you have probably seen this picture online. I've seen several share it, but it's, it's a picture of uh, chocolate chip cookies. All right. And now I've lost probably some of you. I already lost John. He's deeply offended by that previous comment. Um, but uh, the, uh, the chocolate chip cookies, it has all these cookies. And it, at the top, it says one ingredient. There was too much of it in the chocolate chip cookies. So it'll show one that's too runny and whatever you added too much of in the, the batter mix. Um, and it has all these different ones. And, and two of them, they're all off. I think maybe one is the right mixture. One is too much sugar. Um, and too much butter, I think two at the bottom. And to me, those still look really good. Okay. I don't think there is such a thing as a cookie with too much butter or too much, uh, too much sugar or whatever the case may be. And just, you know, the idea of what's too much or what's too little. Do you struggle with restraint, you know, with butter, uh, on your popcorn or whatever the thing is, or in your cookies, do you struggle with st restraint in different areas? Sometimes I think we use restraint we say no only to, to prove something to ourselves or to prove something to someone else. That's asceticism. I'm saying no for no good reason. It just makes me feel more spiritual and better than the guy who couldn't say no or didn't say no. Um, I'm not saying it's wrong to say no to things, but be very careful. What's the why? What's the drive behind it? Our restraint needs to come from Christ. And what he restrained himself and he restrains in us, not what we do in our own power and ability. And so Paul says here in verse 22, these prohibitions, the taste not, touch not, handle not, they are man-made. He says that, didn't he, at the end of verse 22, after the commandments and doctrines of men. And by the way, commandments and doctrines of men, no matter how perfectly you keep them, will never satisfy you. 
Um, if you're following only what man is saying, you will never find that deep abiding satisfaction that comes from obeying the commandments of God and progressively growing in that. And so the essence of true religion uh, is not to be occupied with meat and drinks, but with the living Christ. We're to focus on Him, His words, His commands, not that of man. All right, verse 23, lastly, this is important. He says, which things have indeed a show of wisdom. It looks smart. It looks, it looks uh, appealing. It looks sophisticated. Uh, but notice, in neglecting of the body, all these things done, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. There's that word satisfying. Isn't that interesting? He's saying none of this will satisfy. In fact, it frustrates the flesh. The more we try to regulate it and, and manipulate it, it actually helps us uh, be more dissatisfied than we were before. And here's the thought tonight. You found this if you've tried a diet lately or you're on whatever number diet you're on now or whatever you forgot that you were on earlier this year. But denying the body can actually arouse your body. If you are trying to deny it or abstain from something in a fleshly manner, it actually can, can intensify the desire, especially the ungodly desire of um, the flesh. Paul is saying you're not nourishing your spirit by denying your body. You're actually just inflaming the flesh. You're actually making it be more of an issue than it would be if you would simply rest um, in Christ. Um, church history, unfortunately, is full of stories of this asceticism where they'll reject beautiful things and blessed things. Uh, the relationship between a man and a woman, um, the marriage bed, the, they'll reject parenthood. They'll reject the beauty of God's creation. They'll reject even themselves all to try to just prove to God that there's something of value and to find some level of satisfaction in their being. May I just remind you tonight, that is not God's way. That is a self-made religion. It may seem wise. It may seem at a, a level that others cannot obtain, but it is still a frustrating, uh, dissatisfied, joyless kind of existence. And one author I was reading, he said this, seen for what it really is, this expression of independence from God, this idea of I'm going to control my flesh, says I'm going to get to God on my own terms by my own might. And then he said this, it feeds the flesh by starving it. Isn't that interesting? So we starve our flesh of certain good things that God has given us ritually to enjoy. And in the process, we're actually feeding our flesh. We're proud about the fact that we abstain from something or we don't do something. And we seek to derive satisfaction from that. What a foolish, what a foolish pursuit, Paul clearly says here. And so just saying no toward your flesh will not increase your satisfaction. You are saying no in the flesh to your flesh. And that is a losing proposition. Um, you'll get proud. You'll still cave eventually. May we rest in what the body, what the flesh of Jesus Christ gave for us. It is where we find satisfaction. Um, I was reading the other day, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a city called Krakow, Poland or not. But um, Krakow is known for its square. It has this beautiful square right in the city there of Poland. And uh, it's bordered on one side by the massive spires of St. Mary's Church. Um, and if, you're, if you were looking from that steeple, um, or if you were looking toward that steeple, there's a bugler that will every evening um, sound a trumpet. In fact, that's been done for 700 years. Every day, for 700 years, someone has gone up to that spire and has sounded um, a trumpet or a bugle. And the last note on the bugle, every time that it's played, every day as it's played, is always muted and broken, where it almost like it dies out unexpectedly, as if some disaster has suddenly befallen the bugler. The 700-year commemoration is in memory of a heroic trumpeter who one night summoned the people to defend their city against the Tartars who were attacking the city, that were invading the city. And as this bugler on that night over 700 years ago was sounding the last blast on his trumpet, an arrow from one of the Tartars struck and killed him. And so they, in commemoration of the faithfulness of this man to sound the alarm every day for 700 years, they've had that, that kind of that interrupted uh, sound or bugler um, that is declared in the city there. Can I just tell you tonight, I think Paul here is sounding an, a warning to us, and we're more than 700 rem years removed from him sounding it, but I think these threats are just as real today as they've ever been. Legalism, mysticism, 
asceticism, these things are swirling all around us. And if you're dissatisfied with Christ, you'll cave to one or more of them. I promise you, you will. You'll give in to one. You'll either swing to legalism or go the other way with mysticism. Or if neither of those satisfy, you'll eventually settle on this kind of just denial of your flesh. And at the end of that, all that journey, you're still going to come up empty. You're still going to come up dissatisfied. Satisfaction derived from Jesus is not just passive. It's also protective. Is Jesus enough for you tonight? If he's not, you're going to cave to something. And something that will actually gnaw out and further hollow out the sense of satisfaction that Jesus alone can offer. And so the answer to legalism is a continued realization of the grace of Christ. Read Galatians. Go through it verse by verse. The answer to this legalism is the grace of Christ. The answer to the mysticism is an understanding of how profoundly and consistently we are related to Christ. It's direct. It's personal. It's substantive. The answer to our asceticism is reckoning that we have died, been buried, and resurrected with Christ. We're free to live now. We don't have to say no to anything. It's more about saying yes to Christ and yes to who he is and who we are now in him. And so the answer, as we've been studying in this series, is always at the foot of the cross. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? And are we satisfied with him? Here's the question, and we're done. Will you move toward greater satisfaction by allowing Christ to help you build defenses? against legalism, against mysticism, and against asceticism. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word tonight.